What's up, guys? Joker here, and welcome back for epi ep ep epidode. Epidode. Ep epidode. The epi ep episode. Ep I'm on. I'm on beer two and a half. Give me a break. <laughs> episode seventy four of TGW. We're back again with Steve from Gamers Nexus. What's going on, Steve? Hey, how's it going? Uh, not too bad, you know. Crazy week. Not not too much news though this week, is there? A lot of hard, not a lot of gaming news we got this week. Yeah, not not quite as much hardware news this week as previously. Yeah, we got a lot of uh, a lot of gaming stuff though. You've been testing the uh, the EVGA stuff. We're going to be talking about that in our in our first topic in a few minutes here. Um, uh, usually we start off doing the uh, tech pickups. You got anything you wanted to uh, show off before we get into the news? I guess the the short of it is I picked up a kind of low end thermal camera. So this is just a Seek thermal camera. They're like two hundred twenty bucks or something. Does not have quite the resolution you would get on a high-end solution. I've I've used and have access to ninety thousand dollars thermal cameras elsewhere, not at Gamers Nexus. But yeah, we, you, you we don't, don't have, have it, one. You, you <laughs> yeah, don't have we, it. You don't you don't have it in like an like a, a thermal chamber of some sort or something like that. No, we didn't. We do not have our own ninety thousand dollars thermal camera. But uh, I've used uh, we've used thermal chambers too. They're they're not too hard to get time on. You gotta get time nearby. So this isn't bad for like rapid prototyping of an idea or something, or figuring out what specifically needs to be probed with like a thermocouple reader. So we have we've used these forever to validate ambient temperature things like that. You basically, take a, a thermocouple, you plug it in, and then you can attach full, the. Apparently, I was full screen. Sorry about that. Oh. I, did, I didn't. I was checking my lighting before the show started. I didn't realize I had left it on full screen. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I'll give it to Steve now. Give him, a, give him a turn. Go ahead. So yeah, so the thermal camera box I was showing is just that one. Uh, thermal camera is very small. It attaches to your phone. Like I said, it's not the most scientifically accurate thing you could use, but very good for rapid prototyping. And then you can take a thermal couple from one of these readers and uh, use your camera to figure out where you should put that thermal couple probe. Uh, so pretty cool stuff. That's what we picked up for the EVGA testing this week. All right, and how how much was one of those guys? The Seek camera was like two hundred thirty dollars, so a pretty pretty cheap. I mean, a good thermal camera will be several grand. The readers are a couple hundred bucks as well for a basic one, or you can get one with uh, like ours has USB logging and stuff like that. They cost a bit more, so uh, not too bad overall though. How much are like those uh, those thermal guns? Like you just point at stuff and get the temps. You can get cheap IR readers for like. 20 or 30 bucks and they'll do an okay job uh, i think the one we use was like 80 or 90 so it's a bit more it tends to be have a bit better resolution the only thing you have to look out for with those is the farther you get away from the subject the accuracy changes so when you measure something like the back of a video card you've got to be the exact same spot every time you measure that point or there could be some sensor resolution issues interesting yeah, I was thinking about uh, when, when basically when this whole thing came up, I was thinking about getting like a IR gun or whatever. Yeah, yeah, they're good. Same same reason as the thermal cameras. Not quite as much detail in an IR gun, but uh, we use them for the basically spot checking things too. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it would be good for testing on on cards and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, good to figure out like the backside of the PCB VRM temperature or something. Yeah, someone mentioned in the chat already. Satan said, uh, mentioned the Pascal heat issues being fixed with the BIOS update. I think that's in the article, right? The thermal article, or is that a, or is that not in there? Yeah, it's in there. Um, well, so it's not really a. The thing we were talking about was not like a Pascal issue. It was an EVGA issue. Um, so the those were basically uh, fan curve changes. So the fan curve is more aggressive. Was that so? That was just EVG. I thought I saw something that was like an, a a a VBIOS update that was fixing heat issues on. I think it was the 1070s. Yeah, uh, there were VBIOS updates that fix like the memory performance and stuff between Micron and Samsung. If there's, that's what I thought it was. Yeah. Yeah. If there's anything else, I may have missed it, but um, definitely for the Samsung and Micron disparity. Yeah. So the so the fixes for the, for the on the BIOS was just for for fan curve. So it's not like it was right. a hard, it was like nothing like a hardware failure that they s magically fixed with a with a with an update. Right. Yeah. They didn't like downvolt anything or uh, yeah kill performance or anything like that. It was just uh, the fans are a bit louder now. Uh, or you put thermal pads on it. <laughs> yeah. That's that's one thing. Uh, you're gonna be doing a video on that too, right? It's pretty soon. Yeah. It's already done. We just filmed it. Andrew is back there editing it now, so uh, yeah, that'll be online shortly. Nice. 
Uh, well, speaking of EVGA, my little tech pickup is this just got here yesterday. I didn't even know it was coming yet. Is the uh, the power link, which you could apply for like for free, I guess, if you own what is it, any of the 10 series cards? Yes, I believe so. Yeah, any of the 10 series cards from EVGA. Like I have the Founders Edition, but it's an EVGA, so even I was eligible for it. I haven't tried fitting it onto the card yet. I'm just taking it out of the box now for like the second time. But here it is. <laughs> let me go full. Let me go full screen here again. There we go. Here's the uh, EVGA Power Link. So we talked about this on the show like about a month ago. Basically, what this is for is just to manage your cables better. That's really all they're marketing this as is that you put this on your GPU. You can adjust these. Uh, the power connector here. So right now it has a dual 8-pin on it. If I were to put it in my card, I would have to remove one of these so it was a single 8-pin. Uh, and then you just slot this in, and then you can route your cables around the side of the card. So it's meant to give you... Uh, cleaner cable management so that it's routed on the side of the GPU rather than on the front. Um, in my particular case, though, in the N2 Evolve, I actually have pretty clean cable management as it is because um, there's a cutout on the power supply shroud, and my 8-pin my just comes straight up and lines up perfectly with the GPU. So I'm not going to be using this. I just requested it because I was eligible for it, and I figured why not. Um, so, yeah, there it is, EVGA PowerLink. Uh, oddly enough, does not fix any thermal issues, though. <laughs> yeah. I reroute re reroutes your cables, and that's about it. Yep, that's pretty much it. You were saying that there might been might have been some logic in there too, um, like possibly like better power delivery or something too. Didn't you say something about that? Uh, it sh it will not better, but it will not really lose efficiency, which yeah. is all you can really ask for when you're passing a cable through multiple junctions. But yeah, yeah so it should be about the same efficiency as if you plug it in directly. Yeah, so you shouldn't shouldn't expect any uh, any boost in performance from getting this. You're just going to get a tidier cable management. Unless you were actually having thermal issues because of your cable management in the past, then maybe. Uh, yeah, if you have some really specific, yeah. uh, super bad scenario I've never heard of. Yeah. No, I, I actually could see a use for this. There have been cases where I was doing, like, you know, clean builds with custom cables and stuff, and nothing just lined up correctly. So right. I can see I can see a use for this in some cases, but in my particular setup right now, I just really don't need it. Yeah, ITX boxes especially. Uh, yeah. Some of the ITX boxes have that really specific cable routing. Or um, short, short cards as well sometimes, if they have the uh, the cutout coming out of the power supply shroud, right. like in my case, and if you got the short PCB, it'll be kind of on an angle, which doesn't look really clean, so for something like that, I would probably think about this, using this. I like this comment, reroutes your cables away from the fire. <laughs> there you go that's a good one keep them protected so what's our uh, what's our first topic today uh well i'll let you take the first topic since we're using your uh your article for reference sure. it's the it's, this is the, this is the third and final time that we are i'm going to be talking about this issue <laughs> this is the final word on the evga for the wind thermal issue so i'll let steve take it away since he's sure. the expert on the issue i think we've got uh unfortunately not our final time i think we've got two more pieces coming out one is how to install the thermal pads, and the other one is an endurance test of the FTW cards. So I'm running uh, two cards, one with pads and one without, in real-world scenarios and in torture scenarios like Furmark. And the idea is to see, is it possible to make this thing fail in a realistic way that would be indicative of the FTW cards actually having a real issue to be concerned about. Uh, so we're still testing that, but I've done the basic thermal imaging of everything, did some thermal tests, and basically with... EVGA's solution, there's two solutions they have. One's a vBIOS update, and that makes your fan speed more aggressive. So you'll go from about 60%-ish to about 80%. I just got a text from uh, from one of their guys earlier who said that it may actually be going to 2,000 RPM on the fan instead of 2,200, which is what we published because that's what they told us at the time. So basically, fan speed increases is one solution, and that does drop the temperature significantly while within operating range of the VRM. So instead of 110 degrees Celsius, which is what we were seeing from a thermal camera, or a little higher with a thermal probe, uh, you drop down the 80s, well, to the 90s. Um, and then the other solution is thermal pads, which they're providing for, th for free. You can apply them yourself. And uh, that drops it pretty significantly. It drops down to the 80s or thereabouts. So that's, so that's the top level. So when doing the um, the thermal pads on this, to, you know, cooling down the VRM is better. Did you notice any um, better efficiency as far as the GPU temperatures, what that was reporting in something like Afterburner? So the, the GPU diode will basically remain the same. 
there's not really any any temperature change on the GPU diode. There's, I guess, in some some scenarios, maybe you could have enough heat buildup around the rest of the card in a small case that the GPU temperature would increase. Yeah. But uh, for the most part, this is just a solution for the VRM, and uh, and that's about it. So basically, the issue was the back plate. We just installed the pads, so I, I know specifically where they are now. The The problem was the back plate for the FTW cards and some other cards that we have in the bottom of the article is uh, not making contact to the PCB through an interface. So what happens is the back plate actually traps the heat on the back side of the PCB in between the PCB and the back plate. That's how you end up with 110 plus Celsius. And uh, just quick clarification, these VRMs can handle like T-junctions, T 150 ambient 125, the power stages can do 100 continuous recommended. Uh, so VRMs can get pretty hot, but EVJ was pushing that line. Yeah, so the, the highest you saw I see on here is 109C, right? So did you That's, try did you try um, putting it into like a really small case and raising ambient temp or anything like that? Yeah, we're working on that. Uh, so I've got a couple theories. One is that I think if you have a higher ambient, it may actually be better. And the really? reason for that theory yeah, is because uh, that will increase the GPU core temp, which will increase the fan speed because the GPU controls its, the, the video card, I should say, the BIOS controls its fans based on the GPU diode, not based on the VRM. That makes so, sense, yeah. You're right, so that's one theory. Uh, one question here in the comment I'll answer quickly. No, it does not void your warranty if you put these pads on. EVGA is, is backing them up. I believe they even said even if you put it on incorrectly and mess something up, they'll still back it, right? Yes, that is correct. Yeah, I've got the FAQ that uh, Jacob had posted over on their forums as well here. Um, there's going to be links down in the description below if you guys want to check this out. Gamers Nexus article as well as the uh, forum post. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. so that's that's the kind of the start and the end of the issue. The front side of the PCB between the base plate and the uh, heat sink itself, they're providing a thermal pad that goes on top of the inductors or the chokes if you prefer. Uh, so there's a bunch of those. The pad covers those and contacts to the the actual heat sink so they can dissipate the heat. Um, so uh, I suppose from what we've seen so far, it looks like this issue is is largely resolved with yeah. both of these two solutions. Yeah, and I was glad to see that they had uh, you know had talked about the other cards as well because I know a lot of people I had seen in my comment section were like, oh, I got a super clocked edition. Is, is this one affected? Is the right. classified affected? Anything like that? Um, it seems like the super clocks are not, but maybe some of the higher end ones, maybe. Yeah, I've heard some people complain that the SC cards that they owned were having issues. Um, black screens. Yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of people talking about black screens in the comments on the video that I did and just saying that they didn't know that it was this. And now they're like, oh, I guess it was that. Yeah, yeah. So they've got a, a couple different cards out there. The hybrid cards are not affected. We've even looked at ours and it's completely fine. So uh, owners of hybrids, you're okay, but does it not? So does it not have the thermal pads there? Uh, does it have the thermal pads there, or does it not have them, and it's just not affected because of its power delivery? Uh, it's a little of both. So the hybrid has a slightly different solution for its VRM. Uh, in our teardown, you can see it because the nature of having a pump there means they had to change the heat sink. Um, so it's a different heat sink, and it's only on the far right side of the card. And that's got thermal pads where you would want them, and then the rest of it's cooled pretty adequately by the fan. So that's just completely, as far as I've seen, completely unaffected by this. All right, so I, I, all right, so I think we pretty much got this all nipped in the bud then, and I guess EVGA has reacted pretty quick to getting this fixed. It's just uh, it's a shame that it ever happened to begin with. Yeah, yeah, but you do have to give them credit because, like, uh, technically, for the most part, they're within spec, and if you... It's only when you really torture these things that they start pushing the envelope. Uh, so the fact that they would even talk about this, sadly, is a good thing because I think a lot of manufacturers would just stay quiet and wait for it to go away. Yeah, yeah, that would. Yeah, I've seen that in the past more than yeah. once. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So next up, we have a follow-up. We've talked about some leaks in the past with Intel KB Lake or Cabby Lake. I'm, I'm trying to say KB Lake because every time I say it the other way, people correct me in the comments, even though I think Cabby sounds better, honestly. <laughs> I'm going with Cabby. I'm going with the lawn A. I'm going, all right. Well, just, just to be devil's advocate, I'm going to hey, go with Cabby. You're, you're the one near Long Island, man. <laughs> there I am near Long Island. <laughs> if, if you want to disparage your heritage like that, go for it. I'll, I'll do my best. I'm, I'm from Brooklyn, so I don't know what to tell oh, you. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, so we actually got the, the white sheets from Intel, which is basically something that puts out any time they're doing a change in their product lineup, any major changes, which is confirming 11 CPUs in their Kaby Lake, Kaby Lake lineup, if you want to say it. Yeah. Um, four, looks like three i7s and then four, is it, how many? Seven, I five, six, seven, seven i5s. Seven i5s, and we also saw the i3s as well, right? Right. Yeah, so... I mean, for me, I'm, I'm just waiting for the i7 7700K. I was telling you yesterday, I basically have a build that I'm just waiting to do for that to come out so I can get a motherboard to go with it because there's right. no point in doing anything else when that's going to be so close so soon. Um, and the other t are, they confirmed basically the leaks that we had earlier, 95-watt TDP that's going to be 4.2 gigahertz out of the box, um, you know, which is higher than the previous ones. This is the fastest one they've shipped to date. Right. My question now is going to be is, you know, how much headroom are we going to have over that? Or are they already pretty much pushing these as high as, uh, no, not as high as, but pretty close to what they think they'll be able to get out of them? Right. Yeah. And I, I don't have an answer to that until we'll be able to test them. But uh, Intel, every generation has been, the gains have kind of slowed down. Everyone knows this now for the most part the last few years. But it's it's for a few reasons. You One is things are pretty powerful now and at this point it's the same with gpus gpus have more room to grow but uh software optimization is really the kind of the thing that needs to start being tackled by developers and then of course the obvious argument they don't have a whole lot of competition but oh yeah well at least until zen comes out in which right. we're expecting to see probably trading blows with this um my concern thinking about this you know with zen is are they going to do the same thing with zen that they did with the FX series line, and we're not going to see an update to that in like for like another five years or so. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 an interesting thing that AMD does because on one side, you know, you can up you can keep your platform and upgrade CPUs, but on the other side, that platform does start falling behind more and more every year. So uh, there's good and bad of it. But the the KB Lake stuff, I guess it's kind of the same setup we've seen a million times: the hyper threading on i3s, is hyper threading on i7s. Uh, 7700K, as you said, at 4.2 gigahertz, and then the non-K is 3.6 and 65 watts. So uh, it's pretty, pretty familiar at this point, I think. Yeah, and we've already discussed this a couple times here on the show, so no nothing really is uh, is changing here. I did see some information earlier uh, this week about pricing. Some they were saying that the 7700K may be launching at 350 dollars. Okay. Which is which is a little bit lower than I had expected. I would have expected to see up around like three eighty to four hundred in that range. Um, I think that's what we saw Skylake launch at, yeah. Yeah, Skylake was a little bit weird. I remember uh, because the previous few generations were like two twenty, two thirty for the i five flagship, and then three thirty, three fifty. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of previously what the precedent was, and then suddenly Skylake came out. And they were like. $100 more than they should have been. It made more sense to buy Devil's Canyon. Yeah, and Devil's Canyon is still a beast of a process. Oh, I mean, yeah. If, if you're out there running an i7 4790K, just keep that thing. Yeah. yeah just even keep it. The i5 4690K, they're perfectly fine. And they will Absolutely. be for at least another generation. So. Yeah, certainly. They're for I mean, for gaming needs, they're still more than fast enough. Right. Especially when you compare can compare them to what AMD has available right now, there's really no reason to go out and upgrade to the latest Intel parts just for gaming needs because they're more than fast enough. Yeah, um, I remember. Well, I think when when Skylake came out, I had seen some testing where they had showed the only um, the only major benefit they saw to upgrading from even back from Sandy Bridge was if you were an SLI user, like a power SLI user. That was the only time where they were really seeing a large hit to performance where the CPU was affecting it. Yeah, there's specific use cases in games where Sandy and Ivy Bridge start to fall behind. But uh, there, Sandy Bridge probably is about the point where you're starting to get impacted on it, uh, on the higher-end GPUs. But it's lasted a long time, uh, and Ivy Bridge is still pretty okay. We use Ivy Bridge in one of our test benches, and it's not for GPU testing because it would bottleneck the high-end GPUs, but it's fine for really most other stuff. So would you say, what do you think as age is better, the uh, 8350 line or Sandy Bridge? Uh, then those came out pretty much around the same time. Yeah, I have not tested an 8350 for a while. I've tested the 8370s, which came out a little bit later. I, I, I Honestly, I consider those like all to be the same thing. Like yeah. 8320 to 8370 is all like the same thing to me. Right. Uh, the, I, in terms of aging, I guess they're per performing about where they kind of did originally when they came out like just scalability wise to Intel. But um, 
I generally don't write, well, especially right now, I don't recommend FX platforms because one Zen is so close and it is yeah. going to be a big change for AMD. Uh, but two, if you're not careful with compatibility checking or reading reviews, the AM3 Plus boards have had so much stuff added to them just to get USB 3 or whatever other functionality hasn't been, you know, added because of the 2011 platform. Uh, it's there can definitely be more issues, at least in my experience with AM3 Plus, if you're not careful with compatibility checking things. Yeah, I was really surprised that the motherboard I just got the 970A from MSI actually had Type C on it. I was like, wow. Yeah. On M yeah. on on AM3 Plus board. That's yeah, and they have surprising to, to see. Right, they have to throw controllers on there that are not native to the chipset and let the controller handle it. And that's an extra cost and it's extra engineering. So. Yeah. All right, well, that's uh, basically Cabby Lake in a, in a nutshell. So moving on now to Facebook, which TechCrunch has this titled as a Steam competitor. Now, I don't know. Uh, it's the, This is their game room app, which is meant to, is going to be a PC uh, store, kind of similar like Steam, Origin, Uplay. But it's not really a Steam competitor, at least for reading further into this. It seems to be more or less going to be ported over mobile games or, uh, you know, Flash games from Facebook and stuff, yeah? Yeah, this uh, this app confuses me or whatever it is. Or, like, or well, at least TechCrunch's uh, way of delivering it is saying it's a Steam competitor. I don't know if Facebook is actually saying that it's going to be a Steam competitor or if that's just their article saying this. Yeah, I have a feeling Facebook would not say. Well, Engadget's article: Game Room is Facebook's antiquated answer to Steam. Antiquated would be so, an accurate way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so as, as far as I understand it, it's mobile games, right? <laughs> yeah, it's mostly mobile games that are ported to play on the desktop, so if you want to continue to play bad games once you get home on your PC, then you can do that. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I, don't, I can't see many people wanting to play this. I mean, most of the people play these games on their phone or on Facebook out of sheer convenience, and... You know, maybe people that are playing on a PC on Facebook are playing it, again, because of convenience, because it's right there, right. and it's something they can quickly access without doing anything else. Yeah, Whereas, you know, downloading a third uh, client and all that is a little bit more asking of them. Now, I didn't see in the articles, uh, two articles I've checked now, I have not seen Oculus mentioned at all. Yeah, really I, did a, I, did a <laughs> I did a control F on that as well, and I was just yeah. like, this seems like the perfect place to... Uh, for them to, you know, flog all of their, any exclusive titles or Oculus supported games. Right. I'm, I'm sure if not through this, they will have a solution for that. But it, Game Room seems like kind of it's being ramped up for Oculus or something. That would make a lot more sense than certainly what they're talking about right now with this current iteration. Right. Or as someone said in the chat, you can play Farmville in VR, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that that might actually get me to buy an Oculus if they do that. I, I, I need to go tend my crops in virtual reality. Yeah, it's just it's so much more realistic. Well, I, I don't know. I'd, I would surpa go past uh, Farmville, though. I just saw the new Farming Simulator 2017 just got released. <laughs> if they do HTC Vive support for that, then I may have to oh, get a Vive the, headset. Don't forget Euro Truck Simulator. I, do you do you know about me and Euro Truck Simulator? I've heard things I am, about I'm you. A, I am Euro a I am a massive fan of Euro Truck Simulator. <laughs> I, um, I don't know if they've added in support yet for American Truck Simulator. I think they I think they have. It's it's definitely going to be one of the games that I want to play, but it's not um, enough to make me go buy a headset for it. I'm still right. waiting for that killer app that makes me need it. Like I don't know, like a Half Life game or something. Yeah, yeah, I've got the vibe. We've been doing kind of testing on and off with that for a few months, and it's uh, it's the same thing. It's like it's always cool from a tech demo perspective, and I, I guess as a more mechanically inclined gamer, I lose interest in it pretty quickly. So hopefully, more kind of like I, I really hate to use the phrase "real games" because it does it, it downplays what the VR developers are doing now, but. Uh, it just it doesn't feel like the titles are quite there yet. Yeah, I would agree. it doesn't seem like much has come out. I expected maybe more titles to come out, but they've had like fewer games launched than the Wii U. Right, yeah. Which is saying something. Which, uh, by the way, I don't know if you saw this, but I read that the Wii U is supposed to exit production, I think, this week or next. Like, oh, yeah? That's, that's it, no more. Yeah, no, no more many. I'm sure they there will still be plenty available. Oh, yeah. I'm sure there will definitely be plenty of units available, and they'll probably be available at rock-bottom prices over the holidays. 
Yeah, yeah, I got that Switch coming up. I don't know. If I see the Wii U for 100 bucks over the holidays, I might entertain the idea of getting it because it does have a couple of first party exclusives that I would want to play on it. Yeah, 100 bucks. Just, just, sure, a, why not? just a few. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'd want to rather have that or the NES Classic Mini that is coming out in a few in like a week. I, I didn't pre order that and I can't find it anywhere online. Yeah. I don't think I'm getting one. <laughs> I, have a, I have a feeling I'm not going to get one of these now. Just took your money. Yeah. Well, no, I didn't pre-order it. I didn't oh, know it was okay. I, like I was told it was available for pre-order like weeks later, and it was already right. like, sold out everywhere. Um, I had seen Destructo. I had posted a video earlier today, though, of the menus and all the support and everything on it. And it looks pretty damn good. Right. Yeah. Cool. It looks. It looks good. I still have my NES, but uh, it's it's not necessarily convenient to hook up and play. So. I'm so mad. I sold I sold my NES to a Funko Land when I was like 12 years old, and I got I traded in my my NES and all of my games, and I think I only got like 70 dollars, and I got one game oh, out of it for Sega Genesis. That is so not worth it. <laughs> like like I traded in like 40 NES games and the, and the system, the controllers, the gun, everything that I had, and I got it was um, Spider Man versus Maximum Carnage on the Sega Genesis. I remember this vividly. <laughs> yeah, it was, I, a good, it was a good game though. <laughs> I well, hell out of that hopefully game. you get your NES Classic to recoup some of that lost childhood. Well, they don't have the most important game, which is the Karate Kid. I remember I, I frustrating hours of playing that. Oh, my God. It was painfully bad, but you just <laughs> wanted to beat it. There was this level where you had to basically jump across these just little gaps and stuff, just basic platforming, but the rain was constantly blowing at you. <laughs> and it was blowing you backwards, so you had to keep yeah. constantly moving against it on small platforms while, while projectiles were coming at you and the the rain and the wind was pushing you back it was so hard it might <laughs> yeah, have been but, harder than the uh the underwater level in ninja turtles that's that's the way they built games not a lot of space <laughs> on the cartridge i guess so screw you we'll just kill you repeatedly until they get bored of it yeah, contra gonna... was my favorite <laughs> oh yeah oh of course contra is classic i used to play that all the time with my dad back in the day yeah yeah contra and all the others uh, legend of the seven stars was good Yep, uh, Ghosts and Goblins. Yeah. That was exceptionally difficult. DuckTales also. Good <laughs> games. All right, so Steam Client is now... The beta, they just launched their uh, beta update, which is now going to be supporting the PlayStation 4 DualShock controller, which is... That's good to see. I, I like the uh, PS4 controller. I think I might even like it more than the Xbox One controller, kind of. I think if you put a PS4 controller in my hands, I'd, I'd have to look at the buttons for a little bit to figure out how to use it. The Xbox 360 one I like a lot, though. Yeah, I, I like the 360 Xbox one. I like this more for, for racing games and platformers because I think the D-pad is a little bit better okay, on the yeah. PlayStation controller, also fighting games. Um, but the the Xbox controller would take the cake for me for, for shooters, but I wouldn't play shooters anymore with a controller. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty hard to go back. It's almost impossible to go back. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so this is basically going to make it so that it is conceivably plug and play where you can just pop this in. It's going to have the same support that you would see on the steam controller, which I think is probably dead, right? I, I don't even know if that's still a thing. Anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah. Steam controller. We received two of those and a link to review and we were so disappointed with the steam controller that, uh, I ended up just saying, you know, what, we got better things to, to work on right now. So uh, short, actually, launch day. We had the controllers for probably two weeks ahead of launch under embargo. And launch day, an email went out from Valve saying, like, just a reminder, we've built these in a way that they can be updated and modified going forward, which was very clearly a response, preliminary, like a preemptive response to the impending negative criticism. Uh, I, I, like, <laughs> honestly, the first time I saw it, I was like, this is going to be bad. It's like yeah. you. I'm sorry. You need analog sticks. I don't know. Like just to me, I didn't. I never actually got hands on with it. But to me, it looked like it would basically be like using a laptop touchpad to aim and move it's, around, which is awful. Yeah, it's almost almost literally a laptop touchpad. It functions the same way. Uh, it's a little more advanced. It's got the button press and the haptics and stuff. But uh, and I'm sure there's someone in chat who likes them. But I just couldn't really couldn't really get into it. It's an interesting idea, just kind of poorly executed. Yeah, the game, just, game support was really bad. I honestly have not thought about that controller for a second until I read it in this article about them mentioning that the PS4 would have the same support as that. Right. So, yeah, that was like... That was like and then I saw that, I was like, oh, this Steam controller, that's that's a thing, isn't it? I forgot about that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, did, 
I don't know if anyone actually. I didn't know a single person that bought one and used it. <laughs> we Not spent so much time. I have really good B-roll of that that was just never used because uh, it just. It was one of those things. It was too frustrating to work on for a review at the time, uh, so we canned it until you know an update or something. Which there haven't been a lot of those. There's been some though. I would be curious to see if there were any games at all that would re- would really actually be better than like an analog controller. Right. Yeah, I know there was at least one or two that were optimized for it, but uh, the PS4 yeah. one though looks like a, a good pickup for a PC to have. Yeah, back on topic with that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so this will make it so that you can plug and play before you had to use, uh, what was it, DS4 tool, I think it was called? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, the yeah, DS4 tool, you had to download it and set it up, and then it would basically work like an Xbox 360 controller. Right. Uh, I'm hoping that this will also add in the correct prompts, too, on games. I'm not sure if we'll see that, though. Yeah. But it would be nice to see the right prompts on stuff. Yeah, well, that's the biggest thing, I think, with these controllers. I, I don't know if it was, uh, I think it was... Last time we did a show, someone was asking out recently what's a good budget controller, and I think we both kind of recommended the Xbox one. Yeah, used uh, Xbox 360, like a wired, or just a wired new one. You can right. usually get them used at GameStop. Yeah, and the, the biggest reason to recommend something like that is just simply because the game support is so high on PC, all those ported titles and everything. So if PS4's game prompt, if the prompts work, then yeah, compatibility yeah. should be good. And I would still recommend the 360 over the Xbox One controller, um, only for the reason that the three sti- the Xbox One controllers, um, the wire actually comes out and it connects with micro USB, and those things break so easy. <laughs> I broke three controllers in the course of a couple months just from the micro USB cable dying, and then I was just like, screw it, I'm buying an Xbox 360 controller and I'm going to call it yeah. a day. Yeah. The Xbox One controller felt nicer in the hand, I liked the build quality and everything on it, but the micro USB cable was the sticking point that I was just like, no, forget this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so next up we've got OEMs are no longer allowed to sell Windows 7 or 8.1 on their pre-built systems, laptops and things that you would pick up maybe at Best Buy. They're, they're all being forced on to Windows 10 now, which is continuing Microsoft's initiative to get every single person in the world on Windows 10. <laughs> yeah, whether you like it or not. Yeah, they've. I mean, they're they're taking it. I, they've gone in so many different directions too. Like, okay, gamer, we got to get gamers on Windows 10. They're always a holdout. We got to make some games that they want and right. only make them on Windows 10, and then make them now. And then like when the gears came out, it's like now you need to be on the anniversary update. If you're not on the anniversary update, that, you can't even you can't even download the game. That was a little aggressive, I thought. The anniversary update requirement. Yeah, it's that like, was ridiculous. Especially from, and, and I know. That they don't build games, and Microsoft doesn't build an operating system for reviewers. It's, that's not their audience. But as a reviewer, just needing to have that account now it's connected to your system login for testing is it drives me crazy. Yeah, and that was the anniversary edition too. And then uh, what was the other game? Quantum Break or whatever it was. I thought that was originally a Windows. Oh, it was a Windows Store exclusive. And then I think it came over to Steam. Or one of them did anyway because they were flopping so hard on Windows Store. Mm. Yeah, so I, I really, I, I was, I begrudgingly switched over to Windows 10. I honestly haven't had any issues with it since I started using it. Um, but I still don't like a lot of the, you know, the tracking stuff that they want to put on there. You have to go in and disable everything. Um, I don't know. Right. I feel, I feel like with how intrusive it is, it should almost be free forever. Just because if they force everyone to have it, like yeah. I just, I just, in, I just installed it on a. I got sent a PC uh, by AMD, and I didn't come with an OS, so I had to install Windows 10 on it. And I, I realized I had like I, I have like about 50 Windows 8 keys, but none of them would work because they got rid of the free upgrade. Yeah. So, so I couldn't even activate them anymore. So I was just like, oh, those are just gone. To you waste can, now. you can still, uh, you can still upgrade to Windows 10 from. A Windows 8 or 7 install, but you, I just saw this article the other day. Uh, you have to do it through one of the accessibilities things. You have to basically say, I use the accessibilities tools, which is maybe gaming the system a little bit. Um, and if you do that, it'll upgrade you from 8 to 10 for free. But interesting. It's, uh, it's not as, it's an official, legitimate way to do the upgrade, just not the way it was intended to be used, I suppose. I honestly prefer to eight. I I I like I use not the vanilla eight, but eight with right. start is back or if whatever you use at the classic shell or whatever. Yeah. I because once I put start is back on there, it was like Windows seven, 
but I had all of the speed of eight, which was way faster than seven. Yeah. And less crashing and stuff. I had, I don't know, seven, uh, seven was just like Windows error machine. Uh, bringing <laughs> that, that pun from this end of an error. That was, that was really funny. Yeah. That was a great pun. Yeah. yeah. Good, good job, Nick Farrell. I'm still, <laughs> I was still on a seven for my main production machine, but every test bench is on 10 and our render machines on 8.1 just because like, once once there's a stable environment that functions, if it's for business, you know, for production, I, I really don't want to change it. Yeah, understandable. That was like one of the reasons I didn't want to switch over my main PC because I use it for everything. I use it for right. gaming. I use it for editing and te like testing a lot of the time too. So yeah, I didn't really want to switch over because I was afraid I'd mess stuff up and I wouldn't be able to like edit videos or something. Like, yeah, because the people have said so many random issues with this operating system. Oh, yeah, Webcam stopped working. Right. Yeah, a freezing webcam, Windows 10 issue we saw. Yep. And uh, yeah, if you get taken down for a day or two and it's your job to use that computer, that's a big problem. <laughs> so. Yeah, certainly. It certainly is. All right, so next up we've got the modern, this is, I guess, continuing on with Microsoft and their store. Um, they, they were hinting at possibly seeing the standalone version of Modern Warfare being on their store. This is not the first time this has come up either. Um, who was it that had mentioned it before? One of the devs... Uh, Ra uh, Raven Studios, uh, David Pellis, he had hinted at a standalone version a few months back. I per personally hope that they do uh, do a standalone version because I have zero interest in Infinite Warfare, but I really right. want to play the Modern Warfare remaster. Yeah, I was just, God, God I was, 4 was great. Yeah, it was. I And I, I don't know how, how good the community is going to be on there for multiplayer, but I would love to play that game again. I was just looking on Steam uh, last night and I was entertaining the idea of pre-ordering the Legacy Edition for like $80 just so I can get the Modern Warfare. <laughs> remaster yeah yeah cod 4 i uh well multiplayer was fantastic i really enjoyed the single player in that game too though i don't normally yeah, play single was, player yeah the single player was really good in those games you know going from like that um like that one i would say black ops uh and modern warfare 2 i thought all had great single players yeah and, and black ops 2 for that for that matter yeah i never played uh modern warfare 2 but i did play some of the others the world at war, I thought, was was pretty disappointing coming off of COD Four, though. I, I know a lot of people were disappointed with that, but I I don't know. I love World War Two, and I I I liked uh, yeah. like Reznov and stuff. I I enjoyed all of that, and all, Nazi zombies also was the first time that was introduced. That's true. Nazi zombies was really well done, actually. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've honestly, I don't really like it anymore. I still like the maps from back then because they were a little bit simpler. And it's like every single map they release now is like, how can we up the ante? Right. You know, a, a step further. And it's just like, I feel like they've lost track of what the original vision of Nazi zombies was. Yeah. Which was just being trapped in a building with your friends and killing zombies. Yeah, it was pretty, it was a good time. I, I would have bought that as a standalone, like $10 title or something too. I bought... Uh, I think two subsequent uh, Call of Duty titles on the PC just for Nazi zombies. <laughs> I had no intention of playing the single player or the multiplayer, but I wanted to play the zombies. Right. Especially, what was your favorite zombie map? I don't even remember the names. I liked the one, I don't, I don't know if it's World at War. Uh, it was just like inside of the basement of a house, basically. There's that was the this, first one. That was the yeah. first map ever. Yeah, so I, I liked that one a lot um, just because of its simplicity. You go board up the windows, grab your weapons, and that's about it. Like, see how long you can survive. I thought uh, I thought Darice was probably the pinnacle of Nazi zombies. That was a, a very well laid out map, um, and you could easily go dozens and dozens of rounds with your friends. Right. Um, the one before that, Shino Numa, was also quite good as well. I That was the highest that I ever went in rounds. I actually, I, I, I don't know how I did, well, actually, I do know how I did it. Um, but I, I soloed that map to around 135. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> By myself. I just, I, I basically found a rhythm of, of getting the, uh, the Wunderwaffe. Uh -huh. And if I were to start the round out in a certain area, there was like a trap you can do that could kill off a bunch of the zombies at the start of the round. And then you would just kind of kite them together and run in cir a circle around the map. And then I would just wonder off all of them in like two hits, and that would be like next round. Right. And I did that up to I did that up to round one thirty five, and it was because me and my friend were really competitive with the highest round, and his highest at the time was like fifty six, and he was always bragging about that. Right. Well, and, he doubled it. <laughs> exactly. That's what happened. I was like, I got past it. I was just like, I could probably go on forever, but I just have to make this number high enough that he'll never beat me. Right. So that was just that was I, when I passed hundred, I was like, how much further can I go? Yeah. <laughs> I was like he's yes. never gonna beat this. 
at some point you're like, oh, I got uh, I got things to do. We still talk about it to this day. <laughs> <laughs> I still rub it in his rub a little salt in the wounds every now and again. <laughs> All right, so next up we've got Dishonored 2's system requirements that got revealed. These were a little bit higher than I had expected because the first game was so easy to run. I mean, it looked like an oil painting. There really wasn't a lot of uh, shader effects or anything. Um, good game, though. Uh, just not very graphically demanding. So on the recommended side here, they're actually saying a GTX 1066 gigabyte or an RX 488 gigabyte. Right. Uh, 60 gigabytes of hard drive space, 16 gigs of RAM, i7-4770, or an FX8350. Um, now this is something I'll, I will be interested to test and see if it actually is, is requiring that because, I mean, it does look visually better. I saw a little bit of it at PAX. Uh, did you check this out at PAX at all? I did not. No, we, we, uh, did not stop by to see this game at PAX. They, yeah, they had a really crazy booth set up there. You can, like, went and, it was like a, like a house you can go walk through and stuff and they had a bunch of things from the game that looked amazing. Okay, yeah, I've, I think I saw the booth. Uh, the requirements, I guess, a 10 six, well... Yeah, 1060 and a 480 is not, uh, well, they're recommended, I, I should say, not required. It's not crazy high, but in terms of kind of what we see on a lot of games now, that is reasonably kind of high-end requirement or recommendation. Requirements themselves, I keep using the wrong words, the requirements themselves, GTX 660, 2 gigabyte, and 7970 give hope, I think. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the first one was really well optimized. It scaled perfectly. Um, and it wasn't really very graphically demanding, and I would have thought right. that those cards they mentioned there would probably have ran it reasonably well. Yeah, and, and looking through their options that uh, PC Gamers listed here, um, I haven't seen anything that stands out to me as something I, I need to go look up. There's no like crazy new technology. A Bloodfly Shadows and Rat Shadows, I'm guessing, are something specific to the game. I'm sure someone can tell us about that but well, yeah there's yeah there's rats there's rats everywhere in the right. city so i mean i guess the shadows that's, could be really impactful that's a lot of yeah that's potentially a lot of drawing if there's a lot of rats uh i noticed the option here just now video card selection i think i can be able to swap gpus on the fly without taking G in the visual in the visual oh, settings yeah. one of them is video card selection Mm -hmm. maybe it's <laughs> like in, intel inter integrated <laughs> maybe i don't know swap oh. from your gpu to integrated graphics on the fly if you'd want to do that yeah or if you've got uh maybe maybe i don't know i was gonna say maybe something to do with crossfire sli but uh, that seems kind of weird they do list ansel support and i like monitor selection uh that's something i like i was playing a game recently that didn't have that and i was just like oh man i really this like being just able to forces swap. it to your main monitor or something well, yeah, because I, I have my main screen is fourteen forty, my second is four K. So when I want right. to test games in four K, it's nice to be able to just swap it in the game rather than having to go into the control panel and change my default display and everything. Right, it's, it's yeah. a nice feature. Yeah, and then a uh, normal FOV and all that stuff. HBAO plus, we just yeah. kind of talked about that in a video recently, but um, TXAA for anyone who doesn't know, that's temporal anti-aliasing. So it means it looks at your frame to frame uh, pixels. And so instead of taking several samples per pixel using normal AA techniques and then figuring out what color the pixel or the border should be of an, of an object, uh, TXAA, temporal stuff, will instead look at frame A and then the next frame coming, frame B, and say, okay, these things are changing. So to have fewer uh, shimmering or jagged edges on a moving object, we need to to change these pixels colors basically that's all that is yeah i'm actually just seeing this now i've it dawned on me i guess this is a uh, a gameworks title which which i'm doesn't really please me i don't, I don't like gameworks is it gameworks or is it just oh, if, well i mean if it's got all that stuff and it, it's got to be gameworks it's hbo plus txaa ansel nvidia surround so yeah it's pretty much gameworks yeah sometimes they don't um they don't slap gameworks on the titles even though they're using like hbao plus and stuff like that uh, well, what always concerns me is about when they get these options in there is that it tells me that maybe NVIDIA had their, like, grubby paws on the code and maybe they stuck something in there to screw over AMD. Yeah. J uh, Jensen was in there messing around with code. Jen Jensen personally. Jensen, <laughs> Jensen, Jensen, Jensen personally with his with his tattoo of whatever that thing is, the NVIDIA eye. <laughs> He's just sitting there sleeveless, hacking Dishonored 2 and making it run poorly on AMD cards. I see you, Jensen. Yeah. Yeah, in between his uh, his, his chaperoned uh, Tesla rides <laughs> to, and, to and from work. Yep. He's a very wealthy guy. 
Yeah, I don't know if it's uh, officially being called GameWorks or not, but either way, HBAO Plus is is an NVIDIA technology. Uh, I, I would assume they would have screen space as an alternative, and then uh, TXAA was an NVIDIA-supported technology as well. Ansel, for anyone who doesn't know what that is, that's just a screenshot tool, so that won't impact you unless unless you do artsy screenshots. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did a Google on Dishonored 2 GameWorks. I can't find anything, but I don't know. We'll, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll it, see in the final version of the game. Basically, the, the distinction is is which libraries do they use um, and do they have to plug into the GameWorks SDK in order to do whatever they're doing. But uh, HBAO Plus was created by NVIDIA. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's evil or anything like that, but if you're on AMD... It may be beneficial to run SSAO or something instead. Or even HBAO. I showed in testing recently. HBAO non-plus is so old now. 2008 technology. It runs fine on AMD and NVIDIA. Oh, yeah. H- yeah HBAO runs fine. I mean, But I remember when that was an absolutely brutal option to use. Yeah, yeah. And that was also NVIDIA created, but it was 2008, so it's it's quite old now. Yeah, usually when I'm usually when testing, I will choose to disable all GameWorks features or NVIDIA specific stuff. Even if you know, even if it works on AMD, I just will choose not to use it. Typically, I don't know if you do that as well. Uh, I mostly test games these days, so I don't. I don't really think beyond testing. If if I'm playing it, I just uh, if it's a competitive FPS, it's just everything off. Well, that's so why, all, why, all why, why I mean specifically for benchmarking. Oh, for benchmarking. So for benching. Uh, it depends on what we're doing. Like with Battlefield One, I tested with HBAO on, and then we tested with SSAO Screen Space, and the difference was basically zero at higher resolutions, and at lower resolutions, the difference was about a one percent advantage for Nvidia. So it was inconsequential, and we just left it on because it looked better. I was thinking more like something like uh, like HairWorks. Like hair, on, hair like on, Witch, we turn like on, on Witcher. Yeah, yeah. yeah Witcher, turn we off. turn hair, hair works off every single time because it's gotten better, but the tessellation was too brutal. And the other problem you run into as a benchmarker is when you're playing with these technologies, like there's always questions of when does it stop becoming a uh, a realistic user scenario in favor of having an equal and fair bench. And the issue you, r- you run into is with things like AMD and their Radeon software settings, they have things like tessellation optimization, stuff like that. NVIDIA's obviously got their own stuff. So the, the problem is when you're testing something, you want frame A on GPU from NVIDIA and frame A on the GPU from AMD to look the same. Uh, so if one it has removed geometry that is visible to the user, it's no longer an equal head-to-head bench. So it's, it's real... Uh, Real concern that used to exist and went away, and now I think it's coming back. Where we need to look at like frame quality, in addition to frame rate. I think the better question is, as Gillis Grant mentioned, are you running HairWorks right now? Yes. Yeah, so you? someone else just said, "I bet Steve loves it." <laughs> yeah, that's what, I was, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's what made me. Th- that's what made me think of that. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good one, GG yeah. Gillis. Nice yeah, one. or or Tress FX if you want to be if you want to be nonpartisan neutral. Tress FX and HairWorks depending mm-hmm. on the day. Steve runs them in tandem. Right, he runs, yeah. He runs, he runs that's, both. That's how much, how much tessellation processing I have. Yep. <laughs> At 8x tessellation, too. Right. <laughs> All right, so Hulu is uh, is setting up to now, la- is launching their live TV streaming service in t- sometime in 2017. We're expecting to see this, which will be a direct competitor to the likes of Sling TV, which I personally have right now. I cut the cord a while ago with cable and switched over to just using sling which is more than enough for me along with i have like hulu and netflix hbo now right yeah i just use uh youtube and occasionally amazon for like top gear or something that's about it yeah yeah th- i would i i don't know if i'll pick this up i have read on the the linked article that it's going to be priced at about 40 dollars a month which is a little bit high for what i would want to spend on this because that's i mean that's coming up close on like live that's, tv prices yeah that's competing with, with cable tv yeah, especially if it's going to be limited to just a few networks like they're talking about in here. They're teaming up with Fox, ABC, ESPN, Disney. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it'll be, it should be a good little lineup of, of live channels. And I, after I cut the cord, you know, it, it, a few, it took a few months for it to sink in, but I was just like, yeah, I do kind of need live TV for some things. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, I set up an HTPC on the TV, and so 
you know, it's not bad in practice. You push the button and it's on within a couple seconds. But there's still times where I'm like, I want to want to eat my cereal and I want to push a button and watch whatever's on for 10 minutes and then go back to work. And it's not that easy with uh, with an HTPC still. There's there's a couple extra steps in there. Yeah, it's just kind of what I, I had got had to get used to is just like every night you can't really just go browse to find something to watch. It's like you got to kind of prepare for it. It's like you got to right. like, hmm, what do I want to watch later? Because I just got to pick one thing and watch it. Yeah, I can't really flip around, you know? Yeah, um, I, I just end up these days. Honestly, I just like I watch old Top Gear clips and I watch YouTube channels and that's about it. Yeah, sometimes YouTube is the better option for me. It's just like it's—I it's, don't know. I, plus, I my attention span is literally zero at this point. <laughs> I cannot—I don't know. I put on a movie last night. I put on Lincoln. I was like, I haven't ah. seen—I haven't seen Lincoln yet, and I love Daniel Day Lewis. So I put it on. Within five minutes, I had my phone in my hand. I was just looking <laughs> through my phone for YouTube videos or Twitter or whatever updates and notifications. How, how does Lincoln end? <laughs> <laughs> just Google yeah. search that. Yeah. <laughs> So the one thing I would like, to, I would love to see on Hulu is if they were to maybe add something where they got like the NFL streaming on there. If they oh, were to okay. do so, yeah. if they were to, if they were to do something where they, I'm pretty sure they they can't because I'm I don't know how long the contract is between NFL Ticket and Directv, but it must be a long one because it's not on <laughs> anything else. Um, but I would love to see if they did something like that where you could opt in for a package to add on all the NFL games live streaming because I would love to watch NFL streaming on my PC rather than having I mean I I mean I already do but I have to go to like some dodgy ass website and watch it yeah. like 360p and look at a bunch of ads on it even that are getting past ad blocker and are even further sketchier it's like right. it's like I don't want to click anything do you want to go full screen no I don't, no. I don't know if that I don't know if that full screen button is a virus yeah. <laughs> don't click anything. Just just open the page and touch nothing. It's just like hands off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, if I'm not, if I don't go to the, the bar to watch the game, I I usually put it on the background or listen to the radio. Radio. Right. radio. Uh, okay. So yeah. Hopefully, I don't know. I'll I'll see how this is uh, when it comes out. Maybe give it a trial or something if they do that and compare it to Sling TV because Sling is pretty good right now. The interface, as they mentioned in this article, is really bad. Mm. Um, Hulu's isn't isn't great either. I hate their. Uh, the recommendations are bad, as they mentioned in here, and the watch list is also equally terrible. And I would love yeah. to see them add in separate profiles too, like Netflix, because everyone in my house shares the Hulu account. So I get rec- I get like the watch list is like shows that I don't even watch. It's like kids' cartoons and stuff. Yeah, yeah, they Hulu is kind of weird, but I mean, uh, I guess it works if you need like NBC and more traditional channels stuff like that. Netflix I don't even have or use to be honest, but I just don't watch a lot of tv or movies yeah, Hulu has, hulu's worked for me amazon's worked for me yeah i don't use hulu all that much i mean i have it but i i got it because of that uh james franco series about him uh, having yeah. to go back in time and save kennedy or whatever that was right. really good um yeah that that got me onto hulu and i use it now for a couple of shows like snl each week i usually catch it up on there right all right so all right this article is actually linked over off of uh, your website with the h440 <laughs> you want to take this one Sure. Uh, what you see is what you get. <laughs> it's, uh, that, that it's a photo, case. Yeah, it's, it's a case. It's an H440. It's been redone a few times. The H440 V2 was a kind of silent uh, update. It was, it's called the Steel, S-T-E-E-L, on Newegg. So the H440 V2 basically added a little bit of uh, buffer between the top of the chassis and the top of the top panel and the front and the front of the front panel. So that's all that changed it, and then now they've been reskinning that kind of over and over. Uh, it is one of the most popular cases NZXT's ever made. So the Hyper Beast has the art on it, as you can see, um, and that's based off of CSGO, uh, a weapon skin for one of the M4s in CSGO. What do you, what do you think of that art, though, Joker? I mean, like I said to you before the show, I actually think the artwork looks nice. I think it's a great image. Yeah, yeah. But I would not put it on a PC case ever. I think it, I think seeing it on a PC case is is gaudy and it's it's just hideous. I'm really curious. Is chat caught us up to us yet? Yes, it is. I'm really curious what chat thinks of this because yeah, I, I agree. I think the I think the art is actually really well done. Like the pastel color is really nice. I think I'd have to see it in person to know what I, how I feel about a case. But they are making. Uh, Oh, yeah, so far the comments are not positive. They're making 1337 of these. 
So they've they've added. Oh cheese. my god! They've, they've added cheese to the cheese. Oh, third! Wow, that's that just makes it so much worse. Each each one will be badged. So obviously, the only one you want is the thirteen thirty seventh one, and then uh, it is two hundred dollars, which is about eighty over what you pay for the the black and red version of the same case. Why in ZXT? <laughs> Why? And, okay. I, and, and honestly, I would I would rather see them do it on the uh, S340 because the H440 that I had, that thing ran like an oven. H440 is pretty warm, yeah. It is a hot case. Yeah. I tried sticking two 780s in there. Don't do that. No, NDXT <laughs> is, is not great with SLI. That was one of their weak points. It's where Corsair course, course gets an upper uh, upper hand on NDXT with multi-card configurations. Fantex as well. I, I mean, I... I mean, I thought my Fantex N2 Evolve was kind of similar to the H440 in some ways on the interior layout, but it just runs way cooler. I don't know why this thing runs so hot. It just traps air like no other case I've ever seen. Yeah. It's like, no, it's like nothing gets out of it except for that rear fan. Everything else is just solid and shut up with, in an effort to, I guess, uh, dampen sound a bit. Silence, yeah. yeah but yeah. I didn't I didn't find this quieter than, say, the Define R5, and that, I thought, had better airflow. Right. Yeah, um, they, they there's all kinds of tricks case makers play with silence, and obviously the the one that's in right now is you just close everything, <laughs> and then you put a put a hole in the underside of the uh, the front panel and and call it a day. But uh, the, yeah, there is a point where it becomes a problem. <laughs> and the other issue that I can tell will probably be an issue with this is the same one that I had, which was the Razor one. Did you ever use that one? No, uh, but I used the H440 and reviewed it when it was out. Well, I'm telling you, the, the Razor one or the black ones like this did have, I think, an issue that probably wasn't present on some of the other ones is that it had a matte finish. So, mm -hmm. like, all of the, like, everything was painted over. So putting in, like, screws and stuff like that was a pain in the ass. Putting the side panels back on because everything was painted was a pain in the ass. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah, it was really difficult to deal with and build in just in general. Yeah, um, we have Because uh... everything was painted matte. We've knocked NZXT. I've been working with NZXT for a long time. Like I, I said in the first episode, I've been running GN since 2008, uh, and I've been working with NZXT for at least half those years. So we we have a good working relationship, but every case I review, it's a comment on your thumb screws are not actually thumb screws because they're so over-torqued that uh, screwdrivers need. So NZXT has problems with screws, uh, and they know, but factory issue for the most part yeah they make some nice looking cases though i think the s340s are a little bit better than this the s340 maybe. i think is the best case they've made i just saw they released the elite which i think what is the only difference in that is it has tempered, tempered glass. glass and the inside is painted maybe oh uh, yeah yeah tempered glass the um the cable management bar is a couple millimeters wider or skinnier well it's a couple millimeters changed and uh and then they've oh they've added clamps to the back so they've added cable physical plastic clamps to keep your cables down it's got really nice touches to it it's improved a lot but tempered glass is the selling feature yeah yeah I was watching it on uh, Science Studio or sorry now Salazar Studio he changed mm -hmm. his name um, his I don't know if you saw but he did post a video last night that his PC completely died he has no idea what's wrong with it he, like, I, he might he might need some assistance I did not see it. Yeah, if he got, if anyone wants to go check out uh, well, Salazar Studio, his PC died, and he uh, he needs some help. He had like a power supply, like failure a couple weeks ago, and he switched out the power supply, mm -hmm. and then it was working, and then it died, and now it'll work outside the case, but it won't work in the case. I don't know. It's Wait, what? Like, yeah, like he like he took grounding like, issue. He's got like... he he took the power supply out of the case and he hooked it up, uh, and it was working, but then when he put it in the case, it wasn't working. Was it connected to the same components and everything? I believe so. So I, the only thing that makes sense to me would be like some insane grounding issue or or if the case has really low quality, whatever cables are being plugged into the power supply and it's like causing issues. But that's yeah. that's very unfortunate. Sounds it was, like yeah, it's a bit it's a bit odd. Sounds sounds like time to kill it with fire and just hope something else works. Yeah, go go over his comment section and give him some suggestions, guys, if you want to help him out. Not, don't troll them. Actually, give them, give, try to oh, help them if you can. I think they're getting the trolling out right now in chat. <laughs> <laughs> it, it might be the it might be the tempered glasses fault. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just like I don't the power supply is just like I don't want to be in this fad. I'm out of here. Yeah, well, everyone knows tempered glass just carries a massive electrical charge. Of course. <laughs> 
All right, so next up, EA is basically saying that they are prepared to delay Mass Effect Andromeda if need be. I also saw that there was a uh, teaser trailer had gone up. I haven't watched it yet, but I've heard it looks amazing. Um, I was a big fan of the Mass Effect series. Did you play them all? Oh, any of them? oh, this is one good point. People are saying motherboard short. Yeah, that's that's true. It's probably a motherboard short. That's what uh, I was thinking when yeah. I, when I was watching. I was thinking he's probably got a bad motherboard. Yeah, if if the board is if there's not a standoff between the board and the yeah. case, then there's a that was exactly short. that was right exactly there. my thought when I was watching it. It was just like it's not he must maybe it's it must be something on the back or whatever because it was working outside the case. Uh, yeah, if he took the I I thought you just meant he took the power supply out, but if he took the motherboard out too, then I would definitely I, say a motherboard short. I believe he did have the motherboard out. Okay, well, there's there's your answer if he's watching, if he has a device that works. <laughs> there you go. There you go, Greg. Just uh, uh, check your standoffs or put them in if you haven't. Yeah. He did, def- he did He did. swap it over to a new case, so may, I don't know. Could have been something he forgot to put in. Maybe. Yeah. Yes, uh, Andromeda, though. Uh, I did see the... Did you see the new trailer? I didn't. I didn't see it yet. I think it was posted maybe yesterday or today, even. It looks yeah, pretty damn good. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I remember uh, Andromeda, the first media correspondence we got from EA was maybe a year or two ago, and they were like, do not call this Mass Effect 4. This is Mass <laughs> Effect Andromeda. Um, but yeah, I guess, uh, like you are saying, it looks like they're okay with the lanes. So that's a good thing. It's always a good thing. Yeah they, yeah, they mentioned here that they don't have any financial constraints that's forcing them to release the game in March, but... I think they probably do have the, some that's forced me to release it by the end of 2017 or before the holidays. You know, there's always, we've, I've seen games get rushed in the past, like Battlefront, you know, to, in order to meet, um, you know, holiday demand to get it out before the holidays. But with this being scheduled for March, they got a lot of extra time to play with to get it out before the end of the year. Yeah. And, and hopefully have a better ending than Mass Effect 3. Yeah, just depending on, uh, right, like you said, depending on competition, things like that, how they want to, uh, make sure they have an opening in the market. Yeah, just release the game when it's... Re- please release the game when it's ready and optimized on all platforms, or specifically the PC, though I really... The other platforms, whatever, but the PC. Right. Make sure, make, make sure we're running up to snuff. Well, the other ones don't matter. Yeah, they don't, they don't really matter. I was, <laughs> yeah, I was talking to one of the devs, the devs earlier about uh, Battalion 1944, and they had been talking with Microsoft, and I was like, you better not be talking about some sort of like timed exclusivity. And he's like, "Oh no, PC will always be first. I was like, "I was like, good, good answer. I was like, "As long as it's, as long as it's on the," he's, and he was like, "He was like, yeah, it's something with the PlayStation." I was like, "I don't care if it ever goes to the PlayStation. Just put it on PC and make it good, and it'll be fine." <laughs> they don't. They don't the PlayStation doesn't matter. It's inconsequential. Sounds like a <laughs> mob, mob boss threat. Just make it good on PC, and everything will be okay. <laughs> yeah, just uh, you know, get get going on PC. Sure. You know. Um. I don't know what when is the uh, the setting on Andromeda? Is this prequel sequel? I mean, I guess if they don't want to call it Mass Effect Four, I then sh- I guess it's not a sequel. I should know if it's prequel or sequel. It is a different storyline. I know that much. Uh, okay, that's good. That's yeah. what I want to see. Yeah, so it's not part of the original three. It's a completely new thing. That's that's bad as much as I know about it, though. Yeah, I I mean, I'm sure there are people in the chat that will probably tell us this and correct right. us uh, a lot in the comments post after the show <laughs> but uh i haven't looked too much into mass effect andromeda i've just been kind of waiting for the game to come out um i haven't really followed it much but i i really love the first three games i didn't even really have a big problem with the ending of the third one apart from the fact that none of my si- my decisions affected it really right but i mean as far as what the actual ending was i was okay with the ending as it sat it just didn't feel like anything i did before that affected it yeah yeah i remember um PAX East, I think, was right around when Mass Effect 3, that whole big like controversy, was out about the ending. And I remember seeing people walking around in cosplay like as like serious protesters with cardboard signs about change the Mass Effect ending. It was a big deal. I don't know that it needed to be that big of a deal. But... Yeah, I don't know. People, flip, people flipped out about that. Yeah, that was, that was one. Uh, I remember an article, and I don't remember which website wrote it. Maybe Rock, Paper, Shotgun, or one of the more tongue-in-cheek ones. Someone was talking about how, uh, as gamers, you are not entitled to an ending that you know that you want. Which obviously it's it's a, it's a good point, uh, but also the developers, of course, want to want to play well by their buyers. It's a tough tough line to walk. <laughs> Yeah, Printmaster just said in the chat, he said, Mass Effect 1 greater than Mass Effect 3 greater than Mass Effect 2. I have to disagree, sir. I think Mass Effect 2 was the best one. I, I only really played one, uh, and I remember it getting pretty repetitive towards the latter half of the game. 
one was my least favorite of all of them just because i mean just looking back at it now it's the mechanics of it are extremely dated yeah that's that's true that's definitely true. like they didn't like it was very difficult to find where you had to go because they didn't give you any sort of indication on the map of like where you had to be heading or anything like that there was no right. course um and then also like the weapon aiming like it was a massive circle reticle just massive that would only get yeah. bigger as you fired it it was so hard to aim in that game <laughs> So they definitely, I thought they refined the mechanics in those games for the better as the, as the series progressed. Um, but as far as the story and the characters and everything, I thought Mass Effect 2 was probably the best one for me at least. Yeah, I need to play more of those. I really liked uh, before running, you know, before working on, on the site, I was able to play games like KOTOR and I really liked the KOTOR series. So uh, Knights of the Old Republic, that was really well done. Yeah. Same idea too. I never. I have to admit that I never played Knights of the Old Republic. What's uh? Do we have a uh, two more quick topics and then questions or something? Or yeah, yeah, we're gonna yeah. If you guys want to start, we have two really quick topics that are more like just PSA. So if you want to start firing your questions into chat now, by the time we get done done with these, uh, you guys should be caught up in the chat and getting us some questions. So this first one is that Ubisoft is currently giving away Far Cry Blood Dragon. They've been doing this a lot recently where they'll give away games for like a month. I believe recently it was The Crew. Before that, they had given away one of the Rayman games. I think it was Rayman Origins. Um, so if you want, if you just go on Uplay right now, you don't need to like pay for like some kind of like Uplay service or anything like that, like Origin Access. Uh, just go on Uplay, and it'll probably have an ad as soon as you open it up and say, here's Far Cry Blood Dragon. Just <laughs> right. click this button, and it's yours. And it is definitely worth picking it up. It's a it's a really funny game. I would recommend it. It's about six hours or less to finish too, so not bad. Yeah, I I only played like the first hour. I what I saw from what I saw, I had liked. I just never got around to to finishing the game. But I I like the uh, the setting of it and everything. Right, so it was really cool. So there you go. Just go uh, go check that out. And another one, free download also. This is a the Atom Tech demo from Unity Five. I may actually be doing a video on this. Maybe benchmarking with it. Um, because it is absolutely gorgeous, the visual effects on it. I was struggling to maintain over 40 FPS at 1440p on my <laughs> GTX 1080. Yeah. But, I mean, you guys will see here on your screen right now, I'm going to play some of this. It looks amazing. Like, it's some of the best effects I've seen so far in a game. I'm going to zoom this out a little bit so the chat can see it more. There we go. So, yeah, you guys can download this. There's a link down below to, um, to DSOG, which then links over to Google, uh, Google Drive. It's a Google Drive download, so it's all legit. Everything is safe. You just have to download it and extract it and run the executable, and then it's just a benchmark, and it's all not, or a tech demo, I should say, and it's all run in real time, so it's not, a vi it's not like a video that's just playing. It's actually going to be using your graphics hardware, so make sure you have a strong GPU if you want to run this with the highest settings. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Very, very impressive to see. And it just kind of shows, you know, what you can expect maybe in the future on future Unity Engine. And that's why I like looking at it because I'm just like, man, I just want to see games like this at some point. Yeah, it's got some pretty crazy effects in there. Just the level of detail and the geometry is nuts. Yep. Yeah, so go ahead and check it out, guys. And uh, go ahead and give us your questions now in, uh, in chat. And we'll field your questions as I try to zoom back in on this. If you uh, just a request for chat, I guess if you use a question mark, it will be much easier for me to control F and, and find things because there's a lot in chat. There we go. I had to zoom it in because I had to zoom it out for YouTube and that zooms out the chat also. I can't read this chat on my 4K screen unless I zoom it in all the way, like really far. <laughs> uh, let's see. Will 240 hertz monitors make G Sync pointless? I, uh, I, I would maybe agree with that possibly. They kind of do different things too, though. Like, uh, 240 hertz doesn't resolve the issue that you're still going to be missing, potentially missing refresh cycles, or you get runt frames or something. Now, fast sync with a high refresh monitor would kind of make G sync unnecessary, I think, anyway. Because fast sync makes sure that only the most recent complete frame is drawn rather than all the runt partial frames in between that you get normally. Yeah. Uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, yeah, I heard, uh, some people, a couple of people mentioning the, uh, the Vega. It was a very loose rumor and I only saw it on WCCF tech. So I took it with a massive grain of salt mm. because it's WCCF tech. Yeah. Um, but basically there was a, there was like a GPU number spotted in the drivers that, um, looked like maybe it was like a fury version of, uh, Vega, a Vega oh, okay. fury card, but it was, yeah, it didn't really have a whole lot of, uh, 
anything. Yeah, I don't have any news on Vega. We just spoke to Raja Kidori a couple weeks ago, and we didn't even I didn't even bring it up because I knew the answer. So, why am I using AdBlock? Because I don't like ads. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Um, and I also don't like viruses too. And I find that AdBlock usually helps block that kind of stuff even more effectively than ads. Especially when you go to download sites when they have like eight different like download <laughs> buttons. It's just like just yeah just just block those out for me please of course of course as someone who uh is sustained by ads in addition i would i would also say if you have a site you trust oh yeah trust it. yeah yeah for 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 stuff that i use all the time yeah. if, if i don't if i don't support them directly then i do like uh uh nexus mods like i give i donate right. to them um i was like youtube i've got youtube red pc gaming wiki right. stuff like that Reddit, yeah got we, Reddit we Gold. do like uh so like our ads for example i'm I'm still screening all of them, so it's all just PNGs or JPEGs or whatever with a link to Newegg. So, like, ours are pretty clean. But definitely cross-site scripting and stuff is a real problem with other sites, like your uh, sports streaming sites you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big that's a big one. Hey, if you got, do, you got, do you have, like, a premium option on your website? We have uh, just Patreon, basically. And that's Does it, it get rid now. of ads? No, uh, I want to build that functionality into the next update. We're we're working on the next update for the site, so hopefully in the future. All right, well, most of the sites that I see that do offer that, I will go ahead and support them because I, yeah. I just hate looking at ads, especially sites I use frequently. Right. Here's a. Are you Steve? Are you going to be testing the Samsung M2 Evo 960 or Pro 960? How much do you think people will benefit from 4K video production with a 4K? So I'll just do the SSD question for now. Uh, Maybe we are testing some Flex Store stuff soon. I just agreed to those samples today, so uh, we are getting into uh, back into more SSD testing. It was one of those things I really built up the methodology. We used it like four times, and then we got hit with GPUs nonstop from May till now. So maybe is my answer. Uh, I just saw questions about the Mayflower, which I now can't find. Uh... Uh, is it this one? Have you heard any news about when Mayflower's new DAC? Oh, know? yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it should be coming out like in the next month or so, actually. I just had the latest iteration the other day, um, and I, I it was supposed to be the final production run, but I gave I gave them some feedback on it. So they are going to be uh, re-looking at the firmware and adjusting a couple things and then sending me back another sample, and then they should be available relatively soon, probably in the next 30 days, I would say. So keep an eye out. I'll be doing a... Uh, video for the day one release a bunch of other youtube channels will as well like uh jay and uh logan a bunch of channels are going to have them out like all at the same time so sweet just stay tuned it'll be coming soon uh here's a question do you guys have recommendations for me i'm running an 8350 and 980 sc all my games run great except bad stuttering in battlefield one multiplayer uh, if it's not just multiplayer i would say make sure check your DirectX 12 setting and maybe turn it off because uh, I see stuttering with DX12 on on a lot of devices. Yeah, I've I've told that to a couple of people that were like that were having performance issues, and I'm just like, which DirectX version are you running? Like, is it on DirectX 12? Because if it is, that's why it's running bad. Yeah, yeah, that would be my first recommendation. Beyond that, uh, I don't really. I'd have to. I'd say just start changing the settings one at a time. Take each. There's not that many of them, so you could take each setting and just set it to low while the others are at high or ultra or whatever and test until it stops sucking. <laughs> yeah, I actually, uh, someone had act well, not someone, a lot of people after I tested uh, Battlefield 1 yesterday on the FX 8370, mm. so many people were like, why didn't you test DirectX 12 on it? It'll obviously run better with DirectX 12. Because, because it, it doesn't. Just, exactly, because it, <laughs> I was just, I had to make a direct, like a, a, a dedicated comment so people would see it. I was like, it doesn't because it's not DirectX 12. They have not optimized the engine. The memory allocation is horrible. And it just stutters. It's even worse. I tr I tried. I was just like, cause I was I was not, I was getting I was not getting as good a FPS I would as I would have liked out of the RX 480 because the 8370 was limiting it a bit, especially multiplayer. Right. So yeah. I was just like I was like maybe DirectX 12 will help it and reduce some of the CPU overhead. Um, it might have after like four runs through the same area once everything had loaded in. It might have given me like a, an, a one FPS bump. Yeah, that's what we see is is one FPS averaged over eight test passes yeah because you have to like especially on multiplayer like you have to like circle the entire map and get the entire map allocated to memory before it'll actually run smoothly the other problem too is uh other than that obvious one is um 
uh, the average might improve by one FPS. So even if you're willing to endure all of this for a one FPS average increase, the stutters are still present. So like yeah, there's still yeah, there's still as we call it on on my site, one percent low and zero point one percent low values. The 99 percentile frame times are still really bad. So. Oh, someone just said that now Science Studios, both of his Walter White PCs are dead. <laughs> oh dear. He, he does does he know he has to use standoffs? <laughs> just, yeah, I mean, t- two systems. You start being like, eh, where's the common link here? Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe did, those, did the S340 ship with standoffs pre-installed? I do not recall. It's been a while. I think so. I would think so. I mean, most modern cases now do usually ship with them pre-installed for an yeah. ATX configuration. Yeah, yeah, almost always for ATX. Uh, uh, have you ever had a power supply out of the box make loud buzzing noises? I had to return one. Any idea what it could have been? A buzzing and a whine maybe are two different things. I am not a power supply expert. Uh, we don't review them yet. I want to do that at some point. But... Uh, it may be coil whine if it was a higher pitched whining noise, which uh, which can happen for a lot of reasons. But unclean power is the most common one. Or efficiency, like if you're trying, like I just had a friend asking me about this recently, and he was using a weaker Corsair power supply that was not really made for desktop gaming use, and he was using it with a 1060. Right. And I was just like, oh, he's like, I'm getting really bad coil whine. It's unbearable. Like that's like that's because it's going past what it can do. Yeah. To deliver the performance that you need to that card. Right, which is uh, summed up very well in this comment by uh, Octavio, who says, ever hit the gas in your car and the speakers start whining? Same with the PSU. So, yeah, same idea, basically pushing pushing things to the limit. Is 7700K worth upgrading to from 6700K? Certainly not. Certainly yeah, not. I agree. He says he lost the silicon lottery. I, Only gets so, to 4.4. I mean... .4. I mean no, I mean, you're still not guaranteed. I mean, you probably would get past 4.4, but, I mean, the gains you're going to see in games is going to be so minimal at that point. It's it's not. There's no point to doing it. Yeah, the, the question becomes why. Uh, and if, if you're competing for top ranks in some synthetic application, then I guess upgrade. Yeah. But, you know, that's that's a, a pretty small market, I think. Yeah, if you're just trying to get good game performance, then you're not going. You're not being limited in any way. You're not being bottlenecked right. by a 6700K at 4.4 gigahertz, at all. Uh, How many generation of GPUs until we use modern stack memories? I'm not sure if that maybe that means HBM, where you have multiple stacks on the uh, the substrate, the PCB, and all that stuff. Um, HBM was a big experiment with Fury X. Uh, we know that GP100 has HBM2 in it. Well, GP100 and the Tesla accelerator. And then uh, Vega's... Uh, or actually, there were two architectures that I have on a slide from AMD, but uh, the, I think it's Vega's is an HBM2 intro as well. So it's here. It's just expensive. Don't see any other questions here standing out to me anyway. Yeah. Uh... All right. Well, I guess uh, I guess we'll go ahead and wind down the show then if there's no more questions that I'm seeing. But anyway, uh, thanks again for joining us this week, Steve. Uh, he, Steve will not be back next week. You're going to be busy, right? Yeah, yeah I will be busy, yeah. yeah so thank you for having me the last two weeks. Yeah, yeah. A couple of people were asking if you're going to be a, a permanent uh, co-host. Uh, he will not be a permanent co-host, but I guess you can call him a series regular. That um, works where, for me. Yeah. Where he'll he will be back when and if he's av- when and if he's available and if I still have a vacant slot sitting there, then yeah, sure. Then Steve will uh, Steve will probably come on from time to time. So works we for just, me. Yeah, we just got fortunate to have him uh, two weeks in a row. So yeah, I, I um, there's a lot of travel and managing people, so. Hard to find a stable environment because if we're on the road so much, I wouldn't want to try and stream off of a crappy laptop or something. Yeah, I've, I, well, yeah, I've done that from the road a couple times. It's it's not great. <laughs> yeah, it's a big Especially, pain in the ass to set actually, up. Actually, usually the uh, the network is more the issue than anything. I had to stream. I streamed from yeah. Land Syndicate on a 300k connection. That was rough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hotel internet's not great. No, this was at this was at the land, but it was with everyone else using the land. So oh, yeah. <laughs> it was just slow, slow, slow. Right. But all right, thanks uh, for joining again, Steve. If you guys still aren't subscribed to him, if you want to check him out, links are going to be down below to their channel as well as the website and everything. 
And uh, leave us a like down below if you enjoyed uh, this week's episode. And uh, catch you guys next week. Yeah. Ta-ra.